player for Blue Skies, uh, which is held every year on 7th of September. Uh, the day basically aims uh, to raise public awareness at all levels, that is individual, community, and corporate and government level, uh, for the importance of uh, health and air pollution. Uh, uh, we have uh, a stellar panel with us who will discuss about uh, the impacts of air pollution in detail on human health. Uh, we will introduce the panel uh, uh, in a couple of minutes. And uh, uh, let me just share my screen. Are you able to see my screen now? No. Okay. Just a second. Can you see it? Yes. Yes. Okay, so the title for the uh, webinar today is Addressing Air Pollution and Health Effects. What role uh, healthcare sector can play in communication and awareness building? Uh, before uh, we jump into the discussion today and uh, hear our esteemed panelists, I would like to briefly introduce the uh, organizations involved in bringing up this webinar. So, uh, a Center for Chronic Disease Control. Uh, Center for Chronic Disease Control is a New Delhi-based nonprofit organization which was established in December 2000. Uh, CCDC intends to address the growing challenges of chronic disease in uh, developing countries such as India through knowledge generation and knowledge translation. Uh, CCDC has also been recognized as a scientific and industrial research organization by Department of, Scienti uh, De Department of Scientific and Industrial Research, Government of India. Uh, health and Environment Leadership Platform uh, is uh, a partnership between Public Health Foundation of India, Center for Chronic Disease Control, and Healthcare Without Harm. Uh, it uh, currently has uh, a membership base of 74 members who uh, represent the interest of over 7,700 plus healthcare facilities and healthcare institutions, representing the interest of at least uh, uh, 100,000 physicians in India. Uh, the platform focuses on showcasing uh, leadership in health systems. It also advocates for uh, the intersectoral uh, collaborative policy making uh, to address the uh, health impacts of air pollution. Uh, also, uh, it works on cap building capacity of physicians, doctors on the health impacts of environmental pollution. Uh, healthcare Without Harm is an international NGO uh, working to transform the healthcare sector worldwide uh, to become ecologically and environmentally sustainable. Uh, together with its partner, Healthcare Without Harm shares a vision of a healthcare sector that does no harm and instead promotes the health health of people and the environment. Uh, Global Healthy Hospital, which is an initiative of Healthcare Without Harm, uh, is, an, is an international network of hospitals, healthcare facilities, and health systems. Uh, GGHH currently has 1,450 members across 72 countries, uh, representing the interest of over 43,000 hospitals. Uh, that's all for uh, in terms of uh, introducing the organizations, I'll hand it over to Dr. Purnima to talk about uh, uh, air pollution and its impacts uh, with respect to uh, India. Over to you, Dr. Purnima. Thank you, Mazru. Uh, greetings to all the participants who are joining us today uh, in this event uh, to celebrate the second International Clean Air Day for Blue Skies. Um, it has become almost a luxury in recent years to breathe clean air in many, many parts of the world. But this is especially true for our country. Um, in India, we have been in the past talking about various transitions. I think earliest we talked about demographic transition. Increasingly, we have uh, increased our life expectancy. So we have a different bit, a little bit of a different population pyramid. We have people living longer and more older people and the diseases that come with it. 
We also talked about an epidemiological transition, which speaks to the concept of having moved from suffering only from communicable diseases to communicable diseases. We then saw nutrition transition, we saw lifestyle transition, and with that came all the non-communicable diseases. But what we are increasingly becoming cognizant of in recent times is an environmental transition. We have become, uh, you know, we have moved from being known as the diabetes capital of the world to actually now the air pollution capital of the world. Uh, sadly, WHO has stated that 15 of the 20 most polluted cities in the world are in India. So that is really a call for action. I mean, we need to sit up and take notice and address this issue of air pollution and the associated health burden that comes with it. And when we talk about health burden, I mean, I don't really want to get into the statistics. We've been in several webinars in recent months and years about air pollution and its impacts on health. It causes about 1.6 million deaths every year in India. It's become one of the top most risk factors um, for uncommunicable diseases. And increasingly, it's also being pegged as a, uh, as a risk factor for mortality in India. So in terms of the health effects, we have recognized now, uh, not just from uh, global evidence, but also from increasing evidence here in India, that it is not just respiratory health. We intuitively think that the impacts on health uh, are because we are breathing the air, it is the impact uh, on lung health. But the evidence is also increasing now that the impacts are across the life course. So pregnant women exposed to poor quality give uh, birth to children who are impacted. We'll hear more about that, I'm sure, from one of our panelists who's here with us. Today. And uh, across the board, childhood, adolescence, and adult health are all impacted by exposure to poor air quality. So it really means that we have a great role to play as healthcare professionals. Um, and intuitively, again, we think the role of healthcare professionals is to address the but we need to deliver health care and address all this increasing disease burden that is coming uh, from poor air quality across our country. Uh, but we also have another very important role to play as communicators, healthcare professionals, and I'm not just talking about doctors. We have a very uh, 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 eminent panel of doctors here today. But as WHO says, above the doctors are the nurses. The health actors, the doctors, the nurses, are extremely credible voices in the community and, and uh, but almost revered voices and what the doctors and the nurses tell them, uh, the people listen to. So what we're talking about here today, the focus of the webinar is not just about learning from our experts about the health impacts of uh, air pollution, but also about the importance of communicating about uh, air pollution and its health impacts to our patients, to the community. And how do we do this? To do this, we need to know, first of all, what is the air quality in a particular region. And in India, we are particularly cognizant of the fact that air quality data is not easy to come by. Even at the official level, the air quality monitoring stations that are put up by our uh, monitoring uh, pollution control boards across the country are very inequitably distributed. So they are concentrated in particular cities, and so we most of the time do not know what the air quality is in tier two and tier three cities. And if we do not know what the air quality is in a particular region, how do we address or communicate to communities and our patients about uh, the poor impacts of uh, air quality? So we at our end initiated our own little um, step towards addressing this gap in India. And today um, I, I would, uh, request my colleague, uh, Mazur Azam, to tell us about this initiative and I will Thereafter, look, go turn back to our panel um, to talk about the health impacts of air pollution. So first, uh, Mazroor, can you uh, speak to the audience about our initiative on air pollution monitoring? Yeah, sure, Dr. Let me share my screen. Can you see it? Uh, yes. Yeah. So, uh, so, so, uh, uh, as Dr. Purnima was talking about India being the air pollution capital of the world, and there was a felt need of uh, uh, 
communicating about air pollution and its impact on human health we started this project called climate and health air monitoring project that is uh, the acronym is champ the champ is basically a unique project that aims at improving the knowledge attitude practice and awareness of doctors uh, on air pollution and its impact on human health and through this program we want doctors to become uh, communicators uh, of uh, air pollution and its impact on human health so through this program as dr purnima mentioned that there is a dearth of data in remote areas uh, with respect to the local air quality index and related information we show <laughs> air quality information hospital settings through this program so what uh, why uh, need for camp was felt so uh, we all know that air pollution uh, in india ranks as one of the uh, worst countries in the world in terms of uh, air pollution causing dramatic negative health impacts uh, research studies uh, have shown that uh, in india alone uh, approximately 1.7 million people die every year because of air pollution uh, there was a study conducted by us last year which highlighted that uh, despite uh, air pollution being such an uh, impactful impactful thing doctors are not able to uh, Uh, communicate the impacts to their patients uh, so uh, uh, so what strategy we are uh, uh, we adopted uh, for this program so uh, in 2018 uh, we started this program with six hospitals who uh, installed air pollution monitors and tv screens in their uh, hospital premises and show and they uh, displayed the air quality index of the locality as well as the uh, the uh, relevant advisory and uh, information about impacts of air pollution on human health uh, come uh, 2021 and we are we uh, we are displaying the uh, this um, air quality information on uh, those tv screens using the satellite data uh, what resources do we uh, uh, what, what resources feed into the uh, the champ project we have developed a, a range of posters and iec materials on uh, various impacts of air pollution on health for example on respiratory health on cardiovascular health or on child health which has been translated into uh, multiple regional languages as well as in uh, english and hindi uh, so that the impact and the reach goes uh, to uh, uh, goes to the uh, uh, to the remotest area of this country we have also developed a manual on air pollution and uh, health effects uh, uh, basically a toolkit on air pollution which will help doctors understand air pollution and will help them talk about air pollution more uh, what is our reach right now so uh, 30 hospitals thus far have committed to bring, uh, to come on board champ as you can see through this map they they all are spread all across the country Uh, some of the hospitals uh, to name are mentioned here like uh, psg imsr coimbatore uh, gangashil hospital arvind i care hospital madurai and many more what is the impact so uh, uh, as, as as i told that through this program we want uh, doctors to step up and uh, take charge as educator to their patients about ill effects of air pollution Uh, so we are seeing doctors stepping up at, uh, both as educators and communicators on uh, air pollution and health effects and they are communicating it to their patients we are also uh, uh, doing an evaluation study uh, results will come out very soon uh, so uh, uh, how uh, if, if if a hospital or a healthcare facility wants to join us what are the uh, necessities what are the needs to join so uh, Uh, the program uh, requires an android tv and a running internet connection and uh, we have in the back end developed an air quality application which has to be installed in the tv and uh, once it connects to the internet automatically uh, starts displaying the data so you just have to write an email or a uh, or an uh, expression of interest on help.ch@phi mentioned over here and we will get back to you uh that's all in terms of explaining what the champ program is right now over to you dr punima thank you
Um, thank you, Mazur. So as I mentioned, uh, this would be an added initiative um, and the role of healthcare professionals in communicating about air pollution. Uh, this is a strategy that we adopted to also fill the gap in air quality data in our country. So we have our own little hospital air pollution uh, air monitoring network. So all hospitals who are willing and display air quality data as well as um, IEC material communication, communicating about the health impacts of air pollution, not just in English and Hindi, but depending on where your hospital is in the regional language as well. We have uh, the posters in five regional languages. So while your patients, for example, with the team, the waiting room of the hospital, they, while sitting and wait for their turn to be seen by you, they also learn about, um, uh, you know, air quality in their region and what the likely health impacts are on uh, following exposure to air quality. Uh, so with that, um, I'd like to turn over to our experts who have joined us here today. Um, I'm going to briefly introduce all of you. They're all luminaries in their own right and have biographies, but I hope I will do justice uh, by, by giving a crisp uh, uh, profile for each one of you. So uh, thank you uh, all, uh, all the panelists who have joined us here today. Uh, first of all, I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Kiran Guleria. Um, doc Dr. Guleria is Director, uh, Professor and Unit Head at the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, University College of Medical Sciences and GTB Hospital, New Delhi. She has held various leadership positions, been the vice president of the AOGD, uh, uh, organizing secretary of various national and international conferences. She has received many awards at national and international fora, ranging from the Young Scientist Award from F in Seoul in South Korea in 2005 to her latest Dr. Usha Saraya Oration Award in 2019 and the Foxy Dr. Rajat Sri Award in Fetal Medicine, uh, the first prize in 2020. Congratulations, uh, Dr. Guleria, and thank you so much for taking out the time to join us here today. Her areas of interest are high-risk obstetrics, preterm labor, environmental issues, uh, specifically exposure to pesticides and air pollution, and adverse reproductive effects. Uh, so we st I talked about the impacts of um, uh, poor air quality uh, occurring life course. So we are starting with the obstetrician. Uh, I will also introduce the other panelists uh, before we get into the discussion. Uh, second, we have our pediatrician. Uh, welcome, Dr. Paramesh. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you again with us on our panel. Uh, Dr. Paramesh is a renowned pediatric pulmonologist, allergist, and, an, and a very environmentalist. We cross paths several times in environment uh, research-related meetings. Uh, delight to have you here today. He's the national president of the Commonwealth Association for Health and Disability India chapter 2021-22. He's currently visiting professor at the Dvecha Center for Climate Change at the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore. Advisor of the Rajiv Gandhi Institute of Public Health, uh, Rajiv Gandhi University of Health Sciences in Karnataka. He's been a facilitator, a panelist, and advisor to health projects, not just with the government, but also with the UN organizations, WHO, UNICEF, UNDP, and on the, uh, has been on the Commission of Macroeconomics and Health Government of India. He, uh, again, received many international and national awards for his exemplar work in the field of health and environment. Welcome, Dr. Parmesh. It's my delight and pleasure to invite next to our panel and introduce you to Dr. Murli Mohan. Uh, Dr. Murli Mohan is a pulmonologist with nearly 25 years of experience. His forte includes asthma, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, sleep medicine, and cardiopulmonary res resuscitation. After completing his MBBS from Bangalore Medical College, he did MD in general medicine from the same institution and followed that with an MRCP uh, from UK, from the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh, and post MRCP in respiratory medicine at Nine Wells and King's Cross Hospitals in Dundee. He has over 30 papers presented at various national and international conferences and several papers in international journals. He's a joint author as well on a WHO manual on tobacco cessation for medical and dental professionals. He's a, an a clinician and a well-renowned pulmonologist in Bangalore. Welcome, uh, Dr. Modi Mohan. Um, I will um, introduce our other panelist, Dr. Prabhakaran, later. He's actually on another webinar and will be joining us a little later. Uh, or maybe I will just introduce him. He's Vice President Research and Policy uh, at PHFI and Director of the Center for Control of Chronic Conditions and the Director of Chronic Disease Control. Um, 
he's the cardiologist on the panel and uh, heads the WHO collaborating center as well for surveillance capacity building and translational research in cardiometabolic diseases for the Southeast Asia region. Um, he has been the PI of the Your Health Hub, which is funded by NIH, uh, which is one of the most uh, uh, well renowned hubs in the Southeast Asia region, which is researching on air pollution and cardiometabolic disease outcomes. Uh, so he's joining us. And last but not the least, given our focus of the webinar is also on communication, um, uh, we have with us uh, Ms. Arti Kosla. She needs no introduction to the people who work in the environment space. Uh, uh, just uh, for, the, for the sake of it, Arti, let me introduce you as well. Arti is the founder director of Climate Trends, which is a communications and uh, campaigns strategy consultancy based in India. She's also the network director of Global Strategic Communications Council, which is an international network building attention towards climate action. And we talk about the close links between climate action and addressing air pollution, very closely linked environmental risk factors. Arti has over 20 years of experience as a communications professional and has worked on communicating issues around environment development and conservation in India. She brings with her a very uh, astute understanding of the Indian media, public engagement, and the approaches for advocacy that work best in an Indian context. Uh, she was a senior campaigner at uh, uh, WWF, has worked earlier with Terry, and has taught briefly at the University of Delhi. Welcome, Arti, and welcome to all our panelists here today. Um, thank you so much for taking the time out to join us. The format uh, that we are following now is that uh, we start with our uh, obstetrician, Dr. Kiran Guderia, and uh, we have uh, 10 minutes uh, for each of you to provide us your insights from your uh, speciality perspective about the exposure to air, um, air pollution and uh, impacts on human health. And if you have a couple of minutes, we'd like to hear from you about our initiative on the CHAMP as well. How do you think that might uh, work in terms of communication around pollution and the role of health professionals per se in that? Uh, so over to you, Dr. Kiran Bulaya. Hello and uh, good evening. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. So. First of all, uh, I wish to thank you all for uh, inviting me in this uh, August gathering and uh, to talk on this uh, World Environment Day uh, about a topic which is very, very close to my heart now. Now, uh, there is no doubt as Purnima and uh, earlier speaker has already said that air pollution is almost a global emergency and it is leading to a lot of deaths and disabilities and the numbers, if you count, you will be surprised. It is much more than, you know, even when we talk about tobacco and smoking. But only problem is, I think it is a silent killer. Now, whenever a person dies of, say, my MI or COPD, the cause is on the, uh, in the file is written as cause of death as MI. Nobody writes that it is due to air pollution. So unless we come to that point that in the hospital, when we know the patients are dying, are dying because of air pollution, I think we have to reach to that stage. That kind of awareness has to come to the community. So, uh, uh, so for me as an obstetrician, what is worrying is the effect of air pollution on the maternal health. What are the effects it can cause on a pregnant woman? But more worrying than that probably is the, its effect on the yet to be born. The fetuses, they are also getting affected. So that is what is much more worrying and that leads to the question whether our next generation is safe or not. Because you know the early environmental influences, they have an irreversible and very, very long lasting effects which go on to their adult life. And in the developing countries like India, this environmental threat is coming along with social and economic threat as a triple burden on the health of the mother and the child. Now, we know that pregnant women, they form a spe uh, special vulnerable group uh, along with other groups like extremes of age, like infants or uh, elderly pe people or and all those uh, 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 people who have uh, disabilities like uh, cardiovascular diseases or chronic respiratory diseases. Along with that, I mean, pregnant women also forms a very, very vulnerable group as far as air pollution is concerned. And the reason for that is 
that during pregnancy there are certain physiological changes which makes her more prone to the ill effects of the air pollution for example there is an increase in the alveolar ventilation rate almost by 50% so she inhales more of pm 2.5 she absorbs more of pm 2.5 and hence she is likely to get more effects besides this there is an decrease in the oxygen carrying capacity because of the hemodilution and peculiar to females there is more amount of female fat in the body so all types of environment toxins have a tendency to get deposited and hence she is kind of more prone to develop the effects of all kinds of envir environmental toxins now uh, since she inhales more so she is more likely during pregnancy to get you know airway inflammation and probably lung damage now through this fetus there is i mean there is enough evidence nowadays that the fetus is also get affected and then after the i mean if you start getting exposed from in utero and then you are born then you have a very long period of exposure to air pollution and hence you can understand what air pollution can do do to our future generation now so what 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 we can say is that even a small exposure gets magnified at cellular level in the pregnant mother now the various the, the mechanism which is I'll, i'll just tell you in short how it leads to various clinical outcomes in the pregnancy now uh, whenever the uh, say pm 2.5 gets into the system into the circulation it is likely to cause certain uh, alteration of certain hematological parameters it can call cause what we call as endothelial dysfunction and it can lead to certain you know cardiovascular changes which leads to a condition like what we call as preeclampsia what is that hypertension in pregnancy or because it, and also once the pm 2.5 is inside the system it leads to a generalized state of inflammation and increase in the cytokines which can you know in turn during pregnancy lead to premature rupture of membranes which can lead to preterm labor and thus preterm birth besides there can also be a stage state of increased oxidative stress and dna damage there can be placental changes so whatever nutritional and gaseous exchange is occurring through the placenta gets hampered and that is how you get to um, have babies who are either growth restricted who have low birth weight or sometimes it can also lead to the death of the fetus before the birth that is intrauterine fetal death apart from this we all know that uh, air pollution especially if the woman is exposed in the first trimester it can lead to some congenital defects also which can be cardiac defects or sometimes like cleft palate and others and some auto acoustic defects which are known to occur because of exposure to these various pollutants of the air so now um, the various clinical outcomes which have been described in literature on the mother during pregnancy it can lead to gestational hypertension preeclampsia eclampsia there is also some evidence to say that it can increase the incidence of diabetes during pregnancy there is increase in the preterm birth rate and of course then acute or chronic lung infections and there may be exacerbation of the some already chronic lung diseases apart from that there is some evidence to say that the placenta may separate prematurely what we call in our scientific lang language as abruption so these are the effects which are known to occur on the mother on the on the fetus or on the child what we can what we find is that there is uh, they are born early prematurely they are low birth weight they can be growth restricted they can be we can have still births they are there are congenital defects and there is increased incidence of miscarriages there are certain reports which you know as the purnima was saying that we need to kind of do more uh, focused research and the research methodology has to improve but there are certain um, um, associ association of air pollution even with autism but i think we need to look into it very closely and very uh, with the, with the like proper methodology how the study has been conducted and whether these conclusions are clear or not so uh, there are some studies i would just like to quote uh, a recent study from barcelona spain in 
they looked at 8000 pregnant women and they found a positive association between particulate matter and the preeclampsia then there is another ongoing study in antwerp they are now doing doing a study to find out a correlation with the particulate matter exposure with the preeclampsia and they are also looking at the biomarkers of preeclampsia so i think the people are trying to uh, improve their methodologies to find out whether there is actually a clear cut co correlation or relation between the air pollution and the various maternal effects during pregnancy then there are certain epidemiological and animal studies which have correlated that the first trimester exposure can lead to increase in preterm birth fetal growth restriction and some cardiac defects in the baby and then there is a very important study from stockholm stockholm environmental uh, agency where, where they have quoted that 3 million babies can are born by uh, as preterm birth prematurely because just because of air pollution and that in terms of percentage is to the tune of 18% but what i find interesting is there are studies which are saying that this part exposure to particular matter during pregnancy may be associated with postpartum psychosis or even postpartum depression and then a very uh, recent study has shown that air pollution exposure during pregnancy may affect various growth parameters of the fetus and the important one being biparietal diameter that is the diameter of the head so they are probably looking at these children and ask and and recommending that these children should be followed longitudinally to see whether their uh, you know ne neurological development and iq can be correlated to their decreased grow growth during the in, in utero period however the, the the systematic review which has come in 2018 uh, has uh, said that the one uh, effect of air pollution during pregnancy which we can very convincingly say is associated with air pollution is uh, is preterm birth and low birth weight these two uh, outcomes are now i think very convincingly related correlated with the air pollution so uh, to you know um, uh, taking a, a clue from these studies we i would just like to take one or two minutes more to share our own experience on this area i was associated uh, with the project called daphne that is delhi air pollution health and effects so where we are we were we started out to develop a cohort of 600 pregnant women uh, who were to be followed during pregnancy and their children were to be followed till 18 months to for the development of any respiratory illness and the unique thing about this study was that we had given the personal sensors to these pregnant women to wear for 24 hours during the each trimester to assess their own uh, personal exposure apart from ambient and the residential residential exposure so that was something which was very unique to the study but you know unfortunately since the pandemic uh, struck so we had to halt the project and uh, so far we had done 67 pregnant women in this and uh, we uh, have a, a of the 67 we have about 23 uh, low birth weight babies uh, though it is too early to say any correlation but then we looked at the exposure in 44 women and we found that the of course uh, as in india uh, the exposure we living in a very polluted city and the and the my hospital and the area where i was working is the northeast delhi which is also very polluted so we found that their personal exposures their residential exposures and their ambient exposures all were very very high as compared to the who standards however the personal exposures which were measured using these novel uh, uh, wearable belts was slightly less than the the ambient and the resident so um, in, our, in 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 the in this study of 44 patients what we found was there was 14 14% incidence of low birth weight and the, we found an inverse correlation between pm 2.5 and the birth weight so the second trimester exposure actually correlated the best and we found that with every 10 units increase in the pm 2.5 there was decrease in birth weight by about 3 grams so that is what our experience have been so far and i hope that when the pandemic goes away goes away we may be able to 
reinitiate our uh, studies and give some conclusive uh, results out of this and uh, uh, but everything taken together i think we definitely need strategies to reduce the damage caused by the air pollution and you know all of you have talked about various um, measures we know how we have to and your uh, so this champ uh, the organization is probably not only going to make aware the doctors and the health professionals to spread the awareness but also the patients who would be visiting the hospital would be looking at all those posters how to prevent them themselves from the effects of air pollution and so it has to come into a kind of prescription in the, when we are there sitting in the opds i think it has to be a prescription to my all my antenatal uh, patients that the, how you can save yourself from the effects of air pollution how on a bad air day you do need you should not go out or you do not go out and exercise near the traffic signals or how what are the various methods to improve your indoor air and especially rural areas the biofuel and all so we have to really look into those uh, whatever measures we can do to reduce the indoor and outdoor pollution and till the time we are doing this there are a lot of environmental threats air pollution is one of them so i think what we need to do is also to enhance the endogenous anti antioxidant mechanism because ultimately every threat or insult causes increased oxidative stress so we need to have developed those kind of lifestyles where we have a healthy diet we exercise and then we maybe do yoga and meditation just to protect ourselves or enhance our immune system and uh, prepare ourselves to shield from the various uh, effects of the air pollution so i think this is what my experience has been and in short what i feel is the uh, ill effect of the air pollution on the maternal uh, health but uh, the message here i want to give is that it's the time that we really wake up because it's not only the mother's health it is the you know if you look at the placenta of the patients who are living in the air, most air polluted area they are as black as their lungs so the we are actually harming our next generation which is yet to be born so that is the biggest threat what i feel if we want to keep our future generation safe then we have to act now and immediately thank you very much purnima and dr purnima and your organization i wish you all best uh, that your organization can get uh, connected with various hospitals and uh, in delhi also i think i did not see much of delhi there Uh, associated with your uh, uh, organization but i really hope that that uh, can be done and we can have an uh, as a organization and as a group of doctors and health personnel together we can spread this message across thank you very much thank you thank you thank you very much dr bulleria for that very uh, i think comprehensive overview of um, uh, the health impacts not just on the mother but also on the child and uh, the important fact uh, and the need to recognize that we are just uh, setting ourselves up for a future generation of children who have poor lung health and i think uh, that's a uh, it's a, it's a very pertinent issue uh, that we need to think about um and also for sharing your uh, research on the daphne study we've heard about that one and i hope you're able to complete that work soon um thank you so much and um, i i will come back to you in the question answer panel uh, i'll turn over now to dr parmesh um dr parmesh is our pediatrician on the panel um i think you have slides sir is that yes yes i give to masro he is going to okay yeah okay. so welcoming dr parmesh next yeah thank you very much masro can i have my slides please yeah 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 just a second sir i'll share it yes sir my dear brothers and sisters of my profession and distinguished participants and the distinguished faculty members at the outset i extend my sincere thanks to purnima prabhakaran for extending invitation for me for this uh, as a panelist for this program and i am very thankful for that one the topic has assigned to me the air pollution and child health issues i will take it forward after what uh, dr kiran guleria mentioned about it i like to talk about the 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 follow up of those children what will happen so next slide please okay now the sustainable development goal of who of 17 items among the three for human survival three important things are there one is the air water 
and food to eat. You cannot survive without breathing more than three minutes. You cannot survive without drinking potable water more than three days. You cannot survive without having food more than three weeks. And air pollution affect from womb to tomb, as a matter of fact. Next slide, please. Having said that, I think the air pollution, agriculture, food, microbiota contribute for early immune programming and development fetus by epigenetic changes, which has everlasting changes in the future life of the child also, as a matter of fact. Air pollution is the most contributing factor for the, uh, for the fetus as a matter of epigenetic changes. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, now, why the children are more vulnerable? The, that is the thing is because they breathe more air in relative to their body weight, they increase, they have the increased physical activity, they spend more time outside, and that makes them to five times more deposition of particulate matter in them while during the activity. And they, since they have a small airways, they favor the deposition of the particles. And they do have variable lung mechanics as they grow older and older, mechanics of breathing will change. Next slide. Please. Air pollution definitely kills. That is the hashtag. As you know, it kills about 6.5 million people every year. I think if you look at the 10 leading countries in the world, India is the number one as a matter of fact. If you look at the pollution of the global warming, climate change, anything like that, China comes first, nearly 24%. Next comes America for 14%. Then comes third is India as a 6%, but our matter is much higher in the air pollution. Next slide, please. Now, among the pollutants, we are more worried about the particulate matter, ozone and tobacco smoke. And that's what WHO worried about. The particulate matter, bigger size, they deposit in the upper respiratory tract from 10 to 15 micron. Below that one, they deposit the central airway, trachea, bronchi, and the small particulate size, less than five micron, two part micron, they deposit the alveoli, they enter the interstitium, and also enter the bloodstream. Radioisotope study shows if you inject within a minute, they'll be seen in the blood. And within five to 10 minutes, spread all over the, look at that uh, picture showing deposit predominantly on the lung. Lung has the greatest impact as a matter of fact. And other pollutants are the gases. I think depending on the water solubility, highly water soluble like sulfur dioxide deposit predominant upper respiratory tract, ozone deposit in central airways, and nitrogen oxide predominant in the periphery of the lungs as a matter. Next slide. Okay, now, the traffic-derived air pollution exposure to the pregnant mother's impact of the fetus of 2.5 micron, as shown, as uh, earlier we said, Dr. Kiran, definitely there are small clots will be formed in the placenta. If the clots are a small amount, they have a small for dead children. If the clots are a little more, they have premature, nearly 30% have the prematurity. And if the clot is more, definitely still birth also can happen. The antenatal exposure synergizes with the postnatal exposure with the increase in the susceptibility in producing the bronchiolitis, in producing asthma, in producing continuous wheezing. Air pollution definitely is preventable. That's the hashtag. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. These small premature small born babies, they have fixed airway obstruction. They have more problem later on. Now the wheezing is becoming a global phenomenon, under five Vs all over the world. Knowing this factor, Gina, the editorial board, requested eight global opinion leaders. I am one of them representing Indian subcontinent. You can, you can see it here. And what we highlighted at the time, in India, our own study showed nearly 77.5% of the children under five are the visa, nearly 26% are less than one year. And studies have shown when the suspended particulate may 2.5 increase from 35 micron to 53 micron, there is fourfold increase in the VC. This is what we discussed. Prevention of air pollution is very cost effective. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, now the impact of the air pollution as womb to womb definitely that affects most of the upper respiratory, lower respiratory tract, as a matter of fact inflammation, infection, and, uh, and also sleep disorder breathing from the upper airway obstruction 
chronic cough has increased from 8% to 27% now. And spinal health is the most important. The airway obstruction in children, what happens? In the obstructive airway, do you have the barrel chest, elevated shoulder, angulation, turtleneck, and spine if they carry heavy bag, that produce a spinal problem in middle age of them, they suffer much more of a spinal problem and balancing and all this thing. Having learned that one, let's move further. Next slide, please. I think we have the outdoor air pollution, indoor air pollution, you cannot separate as a matter of fact. However, we have epidemiological data, enough study to substantiate that definitely heavy traffic to those children, they suffer most in the outdoor air pollution, urban children suffer more than rural children, Traffic police, we heard it the first time, they suffer much more than non-traffic police officer. Pro, slow traffic produces 10 times more, uh, 10 kilo per hour produces six times more carbon dioxide, other pollutant. Asthma during the early time is increased from outdoor air from sulfur dioxide. And allergic rhinitis and their coma, the middle ear infection, sinuses, they're all increased. We have enough data to substantiate. And in addition to indoor air pollution, it is important to know that Usually boys suffer more than the girls in pediatric asthma. Here in one study, we found out uh, girls suffer more than the, two times more than the boys. This is eight kilometers away from the main road, as a matter of fact, it's a rural area, agriculture, from inhalation, the biofuel, what they're using, ill-ventilated house. So in ill-ventilated house, using non-commercial cooking fuel, there are six times more asthma in them. And as if a single person smokes in their house, there is threefold increase in asthma in that house and single room dwelling, which produces 10.5 times more pneumonia as a matter of fact. The current data from the Indian Medical Council published in December in Lancet this year, uh, last year shows the, out, the mortality from outdoor air pollution in India has decreased, uh, has increased from 115.3 per percent, but the indoor air pollution mortality decreased from 64.3 percent from the various uh, projects our government has taken such Bharat and other uh, visual project helped a great deal as a matter. Having learned this epidemiological data, let's move further. Next slide. Okay, of course, we all know it's the invisible air pollution, invisible, uh, the invisible killer. The small the, uh, the children, premature babies, small babies who are exposed to pollution, they are born the fixed airway obstruction. Their air is always small. They continue to have later on obstructive airway diseases and COPDs and persistent asthma, a whole lot of them. There is increased cardiovascular disease and blood pressure and stroke, cancer, insulin resistant diabetes, obesity and baldness also come from the air pollution. Next slide, please. And other central nervous system from air pollution, anosmia, having loss of smell, coronavirus, we've been doing that one, as a, Anosmia can also from air pollution, from the nasal obstruction, producing polyp and all this thing. Autism, Alzheimer's disease, dementia, cognitive performance, recurrent headache has been appreciated from the Taiwan recently, has come there last year. 12.9% of the children have a constant headache, like a migraine, but it's not migraine, it is not other headache as a relative. How do you correlate it? They correlate, the, these are all the children from urban area who have been exposed to the air pollution, where there is a high density of vehicular traffic and 2.5 micron total hydrocarbon is much higher in that air pollution. This is what's called chronic headache is also one other problem we are going to face. Next slide, please. And in behavior problem is one have been contributed. We have enough data to substantiate it. There is increased crime road and the pollution is very high. Impaired judgments can happen. Children score less score when the polluted area examination is there. Reduced productivity in the work, immune uh, suppression is also there from the air pollution. Next slide, please. Next. So now the positive signs of clean air, climate, next, uh, climate change. Three important things I like to highlight. National mission of clean air. I think the PM announced, our Prime Minister announced clean air for all on 15th of August, 2020. He wants to reduce our pollution from India from 35 to 50% between 2026. Uh, and I'm very happy of that one. And WHO NGO, I'm one of the member of this Climate and Health Working Committee. So a letter being drafted to give it to the uh, policy makers who are going to meet in November uh, in Glasgow. And for this, we have one of the signatories, Indian Academy of Pediatrics and Indian Academy of Environment Child Health Group and Pediatric Association of India. 
in addition to the yesterday only 230 health journals across the world published a joint editorial it will be released on that day uh, the, the conference will be there in the glasgow let's think locally let's think act, uh, uh, act locally propagate our good results globally next slide please ladies and gentlemen next slide positive development sustainable system is there any other study nature has produced this study as a matter of fact coronavirus lockdown period no traffic less activity of the human beings we could be able to see 150 200 kilometers away the kanchenjunga from darjeeling which people never did because of the air pollution poor uh, uh, quality air and all this thing visibility and the lesson learned during the pandemic need to be pursued propagated and practiced based on science to save our planet earth from the air pollution with all the stakeholders and the society as well with clean air and blue sky we can see it now i think we have to emulate this in future next slide please next slide please. last one ladies and gentlemen a healthy breath will always bring a healthy life let each one teach one and plant one tree and maintain it. in addition with all the efforts of commitment of all the stakeholders we can and we will overcome the air pollution global warming by 2030 with all your help thanks a lot for your patient hearing for your time thank you dr parmesh as always a frequent overview not just the impacts on the child health but also from an environmentalist uh, perspective uh, for for that uh, passionate plea to uh, all stakeholders thank you so much we'll thank come back and in the Q and A session, um, next we have our uh, uh, adult uh, uh, clinicians. We have first Dr. Mudli Mohan, the pulmonologist on the panel, uh, welcoming uh, Dr. Mudli Mohan next to give his perspectives. Thank you, Dr. Podima, for that kind introduction. Uh, I will also be sharing my slides. So, could I share the screen now? Uh, yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. Yes, sir. Try uh, clicking on share screen and you will be able to. Visible now? Yes. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, th as I said, thank you. Thank you to uh, the Public Health Foundation, to Dr. Purdima in particular, and the CHAM program. Hope to see it really take off and do really well. It's always very difficult to follow up with Dr. Parmesh. I mean, he's uh, one of the pioneers in this area. He's been a leader Bangalore in India and in the world in this area. But I, you know, uh, he's encouraged me a great deal and I hope to join him in, you know, a lot of the work that he does. I'll be talking about, you know, the health status of our country in general. And, you know, when we look at it, we look at various uh, different problems which we can measure as deaths or disability adjusted life years and so on. And so we have uh, the Global Burden of Disease Study, which was published a few years ago, a uh, couple of years ago. And we had a distinguished panel leading this. Uh, I am sorry, I seem to have the wrong file that I've opened. Okay, so we had uh, a few expert groups and one of the expert groups was headed by Dr. Prabhakar who's gonna be speaking next. And our chronic respiratory disease group was headed by Dr. Sandeep Salvi, whom I had the pleasure of joining on this program. And we had this paper published in 2016, in the Global Garden of Disease. And one uh, of the important uh, only facts- Only your, your slides are not visible. 
Yeah, not with sure. Yeah. And if it doesn't work, I'll just visible down. Yes, we can see your slides now. Yeah. yeah. So one of the facts that came out of this Global Burden of Disease report is that we have a huge problem of COPD and asthma. And one in every six cases of uh, COPD in India uh, is from, uh, in the world is from India one in three asthma and one in three COPD cases. And we rank second in the world for asthma and first in the world for COPD, recently overtaking even China. And this is both in prevalence as well as deaths and disability adjusted life years. And COPD happens to be after ischemic heart disease, the second most common cause of deaths as well as disability adjusted life years. So, as I just mentioned, we've overtaken China recently and are far above one of the other big countries, Brazil, and other developing nations like Indonesia in our COPD prevalence. We've increased from about 6.45 million in 1971 to about 55 million in 2016. This has been a period of huge economic growth, but also of increasing pollution in the country. And this includes both outdoor and indoor air pollution. So the burden doubled in the first four decades. And then in just five years, we've added another 40 million to the burden. Part of this is, of course, better reporting. It's not just an increase in the burden, but there was an unrecognized burden earlier, which we are recognizing now. And when you look at the risk factors for COPD in India, globally, about a third of cases come because of tobacco smoking, but in India, it's only about a fifth. Whereas ambient air pollution, household air pollution, indoor air pollution, and occupational exposures account for the vast majority, almost four in five cases. And this is again true when you come to deaths associated with COPD. We calculated that about 14% of deaths were due to tobacco smoking, whereas there was a huge burden from ambient air pollution outdoors, the household air pollution and occupational pollutants. And this is true across the states. It varies between states, which was the subject of another paper, nations within a nation. But you can see that, especially in the middle belt, uh, Uttarakhand, Bihar, uh, to a large extent, West Bengal and UP, uh, there has been a huge burden of disease associated with all these factors. We know that tobacco smoking is very common in UP and West Bengal, for example, but actually ambient uh, particulate matter as well as household air pollution accounts for a greater burden of disease causing COPD, both for disability adjusted life years and deaths. Uh, this was for uh, deaths also. And if you look at which countries are more likely to have a problem, you can see that the low middle and the middle uh, social de development index, uh, we find that household air pollution and ambient particulate matter account for more than 50% of the burden. So we fall into this group. And for us, middle SDI countries, we have to really look at this burden. And while we are trying to control smoking, we have to equally focus on outdoor and indoor air pollution. This was another study conducted by my colleague, Dr. Sandeep Salvi, a very interesting study where on a single day, they looked at the diagnosis made by physicians and GPs across the country, spread right across the whole country. This was a 204,000 plus patients spread across 880 cities and towns and looking at all age groups. And the Top five diagnoses made by GPs and physicians for walk-in patients was hypertension and obstructive air-based diseases, which includes both asthma and COPD, as well as upper respiratory infections. These were the top three diagnoses. And when you look at the causes of these, as I said, obstructive airways diseases being the second, 
spread right across whether you're looking at private clinics, private hospitals and government hospitals. And you come across what patients attributed their disease or their current symptoms to. And almost 50% said pollution and dust were the main causes of their respiratory problems. So it's not just from the data that we've collected, but it's also the patient's perception, the people's perception that pollution and dust are major contributors to their uh, problems. About 23% of them accepted that tobacco smoke could be their problem also, and others attributed to chemicals and changes in weather all of which we know are in some way rela related to worsening pollution in our country and worldwide. So these were the asthma triggers and this was unprompted. Just ask directly, what do you think is making you worse? Why have you come in today? So we had our own study, which again looked at the focus on uh, admissions for asthma. This was an ecological retrospective times uh, series studies. And we looked at various problems that reached significance when we looked at their changes in the few days before a patient was admitted for an asthma exacerbation. And very high on the list were uh, particulate matter 2.5 and particulate matter 10, as well as the nitric oxide that, nitrogen dioxide, I'm sorry, that uh, were, showed a sharp peak between two and five days before a person's admission for an asthma exacerbation. And this occurred across four different seasons in the year. There was, of course, a lag between the exposure and the asthma worsening, which to me spells even greater the cause-effect relationship between the heightened NO2 levels and the PM10 and 2.5 levels. We can't complete any talk without talking about COVID-19. And uh, Dr. Paramesh already spoke to you about how the lockdown has had a very beneficial effect on pollution, uh, not only in India, but worldwide. But there is another aspect to it. We know that the higher the pollution, the greater is the COVID case fatality rate and the severe COVID rate. And this was beautifully brought out in a paper published fairly recently. It, initially, it was a preprint, but now has been published in Science Advances where they looked at air pollution and COVID-19 mortality in the United States. And here you can see a fairly close relationship between areas of air pollution and the COVID-related case fatality rates uh, in the United States. Uh, and very clearly, COVID-19 is higher in patients, places where there is higher pollution and is associated with greater mortality rates, case fatality rates, where there is higher pollution. It's not very clear what this is due to, but it may be due to two factors. And this stems from previous data that we have on infections and air pollution. That particulate matter seems to form a nidus for virus to, to settle on and be taken into the lungs. The particulate matter we know also induces inflammation, which makes it more easy for the virus or other infectious organisms to cause disease and cause a greater burden of disease. So, the impact of COVID-19 on air pollution has been to decrease air pollution, but the impact of air pollution has been to increase COVID-19 mortality. So I'll summarize, air pollution is a huge and worsening problem in the developing world and in India. There is a variation between states in the burden of respiratory disease, and this may be related to variations in the pollution burden of these states. Indoor and air, outdoor air pollution have been linked with disease. And this has been particularly brought out in papers by Professor Peter Barnes and Sandeep Salvi showing that our burden of non-smoking COPD is extremely high. And a lot of these, almost 60% occurs in people who never smoke or been exposed to secondhand tobacco smoke, is closely associated with the indoor air pollution burden. And this has been carefully matched, not only with Shula related smoke, but also things like uh, temple smoke, you know, what uh, priests are exposed to in their havens and uh, also with the uh, jaw sticks and the dupe sticks and the agarbati sticks that we use in our uh, areas. And a major problem is with mosquito repellents, the, uh, you know, the tortoise kind of coils that have been burnt 
which are highly polluting, especially when the windows and doors are closed, which is how people use them. Finally, and I think Dr. Paramesh and Dr. Purnima, Dr. Prabhakaran are excellent advocates, advocates for this. Doctors need to remember that air pollution is rising. It is our responsibility as our, in an individual patient encounter to ask about air pollution and also to engage in the wider aspect in advocacy for cleaner air for our patients, for our children, and for ourselves. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Murli Mohan. Um, I think it's always um, important to remind ourselves of the stark reality so far as it concerns lung health in India. Um, it's, it's really just worsening and it's important for us to be um, cognizant of those uh, facts. Uh, thank you so much for that comprehensive overview and also for signing off with that message again about doctors being important um, advocates around clean air, not just at the individual level, but also uh, you know, for patients and the communities as well. Um, so uh, we come back to you again in the question answer session. Uh, but turning over now to the, um, the cardiologists on our panel, um, I'll hand over now to Dr. Prabhakaran uh, to walk us through the cardiovascular effects of um, air pollution. The mic is muted, you have to unmute yourself. I'm sorry, uh, my mic was muted. So I was uh, starting to say that uh, when we talk about air pollution, uh, people generally think of two or three things. One is uh, children's issues, particularly bronchial asthma, and among studies, uh, what Dr. Murli Mohan spoke about, uh, chronic obstructive lung disease. Not many people think of cardiovascular diseases and uh, they think air pollution is too far uh, fetched to cause cardiovascular disease or to impact cardiovascular diseases. Now, what I'm going to do in the next few minutes is basically look at what uh, air pollution does to cardiovascular diseases and what, what can we do about it. So it is said that worldwide, 7 million people die prematurely every year from air pollution. That, what we mean by premature? That is people who die before the age of 70 years. If you Globally, if you accept overall life expectancy to be 70 years, and if anybody dies before the age of 70 years, it's considered premature. And it's uh, estimated of the 58 to 60 million deaths, nearly 10 to 12 percent of the deaths occur prematurely, and that's largely contributed by air pollution. This picture may come as a surprise to many. Of the air pollution-related deaths, one third of it is related to ischemic heart disease, around one fifth of it to chronic obstructive lung disease, 7% from lung cancer. And if you consider stroke also as part of cardiovascular disease, it's another fifth and another fifth due to pneumonia. So clearly the two vascular diseases, heart disease and stroke contribute to more than 50% of air pollution related deaths. So if you look at the attributable fraction for air pollution, actually it's ahead of uh, smoking in women. Air pollution is a leading cause of cardiovascular disease deaths among women, whereas smoking still continues to remain the uh, major cause of death amongst males. But you, you look at it, you would be very surprised to see high fasting plasma glucose, obesity, diet high in sodium and low physical activity coming way behind uh, air pollution as a cause of uh, death both in males and females. Having said this, this picture is very, very familiar to everybody. The WHO guideline says the safe levels of annual exposure to PM2.5 on an average is 10 microgram per cubic meter. If you use this metrics to see how our cities are behaving or how, our, how India is behaving, 99% of the districts are above this WHO annual exposure guidelines. So India did a better thing, they said, 
this is too too very stringent let's have a liberal uh, level and they said anything above 40 is not very good we should have every every place should have less than 40 and if you use that national ambient air quality uh, standards 60% of the cities on an average about have about 40 uh, microgram uh, per cubic meter and you can see this dark red patch here, the Indo-Gangetic plain of India, starting from Pakistan till Bangladesh, has very high levels of PM2.5 annually. So in terms of cardiovascular disease, what are all the problems that it causes? It's known to increase the risk for heart attack. And if you combine it with climate change, where there can be sudden changes in the temperature, very high temperatures and very low temperatures, again, People who are vulnerable can have a heart attack during those episodes. It compromises um, uh, the brain circulation and it can cause stroke. It causes atherosclerotic clot. It causes peripheral vascular disease or gangrene. And as Dr. Moli Mohan showed, it also causes chronic obstructive lung disease. And in addition, it causes intermediate uh, problems such as hypertension, diabetes, and obesity. And in the elderly, it can cause dementia or cognitive impairment and also lead to heart failure. One of the strongest evidence worldwide has been shown for heart failure. Air pollution, PM 2.5 levels have been linked to heart failure. Anything about 10 actually increases the risk around 10% 10, 10 across the world in terms of developing heart failure. Now, in terms of the mechanisms, this has been alluded to earlier, and I'm not going to talk in great detail. PM 2.5, which is just one component of the air pollution markers. There are others. PM 2.5 uh, causes endothelial dysfunction causes uh, increased inflammation and lipid peroxidation, increases blood pressure, and causes abnormalities of the heart rhythm, which lead to intermediate um, diseases like metabolic abnormalities, diabetes, atherosclerosis, hypertension, arrhythmias, and LV dysfunction, which finally result in ischemic heart disease, peripheral vascular disease, heart failure, arrhythmias, and sudden death. So in terms of India, what is the evidence base that we have? Most studies are somewhat deficient in exposure, but largely in outcome measurement. For linking air pollution to uh, any disease, you require two things. You require a very good exposure assessment, and you require it to be linked to an outcome, and the outcome assessments have to be robust. The exposure assessments, a lot of people have worked on, and you can get some kind of exposure assessment, but I'll come to the limitations of these exposure assessments, and you require a robust measurements of how to do it. But the bigger problem is, that the outcomes that have been linked are all cross-sectional. When I mean cross-sectional, people go and say, we'll measure the air pollution level today and we'll see how many people have heart disease. Now that does gives you some kind of association, but it is not predictive. You really require to look at long-term cohorts to do it. So in addition, there has been little or no examination of cardiometabolic diseases, outcomes and risk factors, uh, prenatal and early childhood exposures and neurodevelopmental effects. And most studies, as I mentioned, are either time series or cross-sectional. And in fact, we haven't really broken down in terms, if you're, if you're sitting in a car for one hour, you have much more exposure. If you're cooking at a home without ventilation, you have much more exposure to PM2.5. And those kind of issues have not been studied in a very disaggregated, granular fashion. So we had an opportunity to study the link of air pollution to hypertension through what we call as the GeoHealth Hub which is one of the hubs across the world. It's one of the seven hubs across the world. And the whole idea here was to develop a robust model to estimate air pollution exposure to air pollution at one square kilometer into one square kilometer grid and estimates this association uh, between exposure to air pollution. And of course, air pollution is modified by many other factors, such as temperature, um, wind speed, land use, so many other factors. And so we needed to adjust that and we wanted to look at its link to cardiovascular and metabolic risk factors and cardiovascular diseases. In addition, we are looking at uh, DNA methylation patterns and see if air pollution can cause DNA methylation, altering the DNA uh, adversely. And we are also looking at the examination of the association between air pollution and vitamin D levels. This community knows that vitamin D levels are low in Indians. In fact, it's said that 80% of Indians have low vitamin D. Could it be that the ultraviolet rays, uh, rays are filtered out and we do not have enough sun rays for conversion of uh, vitamin D in the skin. And that's one of the questions that we are answering. Most people who have measured air pollution have used satellite data, but that's inadequate. So what we have done is we have looked at monitoring data from in the city of Delhi and Chennai, and we are extending it to other parts of the country. We are looking at satellite data 
uh, which gives something called the aerosol optical depth. And from that, you can infer the values of PM2.5. We have looked at land use variables in the city of Delhi, and we looked at a chemical transport model, and uh, we use machine learning and artificial intelligence in terms of uh, getting the PM2.5 levels in the city of Delhi. This is a humongous exercise. It requires almost like a supercomputer to work on it uh, because it, it, it has, like for example, uh, in, in, in Delhi, we had close to 7 million observations and that amount of data acquisition and uh, data analysis requires a lot of time. And so we've obtained these figures, as you can see here. You can see in Delhi, in the city of Delhi in 2010, as compared to 2016, the pollution levels were lower, but it increased rapidly by 2016. Second thing you can see, the pollution started occurring earlier in 2016, starting from end of September itself, and extended to a longer time as compared to um, uh, 2010. That, that's mean, that means from September to March, we had pollution. In Chennai, for example, the coastal areas, which are very close to sea breeze, had a lower level of pollution as compared to inland Chennai. And so we created a walkability index because we advise people to walk and Pollution is an important factor which uh, is detrimental to walking. The second thing we looked at is in terms of transport density and we found wherever there was high transport density, people had higher levels of blood pressure. We put all of these together and looked at what happens if for every 25 microgram per cubic uh, meter increase of PM2.5, the blood pressure increases by 3.5 to 5 millimeters of mercury at different points of time. There is a short-term effect, there's a medium-term effect, and there's a long-term effect. Now, some of you might ask, after all, what is three to five millimeters of mercury? I mean, what happens if it just goes from 120 to 125? Where is the problem? We can just leave it as such. So we looked at what happens in terms of the incidence of hypertension. A three to five millimeter increase in population can result in a huge increase in blood pressure, a huge increase in hypertension, and I'll show you how it happens. Now, here is a figure which shows, let's take this particular figure. The mean blood pressure here is 135, and the mean blood pressure of this figure is 140. Now, we are talking of a 5 millimeter change. When you look at 5 millimeter change, the number of people with hypertension in this particular group of people is much lower than this group of people because when you have a mean of 140, 50% of the people have hypertension. And in fact, it has been estimated that a reduction of 2 millimeters from 140 can reduce stroke by 6%. Can reduce coronary heart disease by 3% and overall there can be a 3% reduction in mortality. A reduction of 5 millimeters is a huge difference. It can reduce stroke by 14% and coronary artery disease mortality by 9%. So that's the power of uh, policy changes in which you actually positively impact people. And therefore, it's very important that we convey it to policymakers. This is a little complex figure, but this also shows the same example in terms of diabetes. As you can see, as air pollution levels increase, the, the incidence of diabetes increases. Now, what can we do about it? My, uh, uh, my mentor, Dr. Reddy, used to say that if you have to combat anything at a population level, there are three things that we require. He called it the three E's. You require an energetic profession, which is why we are meeting here today. We require an uh, empowered community and uh, we require an enlightened polity. So policymakers need to be enlightened and doctors are the best uh, communicators because they have many of the policymakers as patients and we should use this opportunity to communicate to, to the policymakers. However, we have to be very, very careful because from a policymaker's perspective, if you look at it, they are bombarded with multiple messages. People talk about social values, people talk about limited knowledge, so the best thing they take is they say, this is not a big problem. If there are multiple things which people say, there's, there's no problem. And that's what we hear many times. They say air pollution is not a problem. We need clear cut messages. And I've given you some ample evidence to show that doctors, uh, uh, ample evidence to show that air pollution is an important uh, factor in terms of cardiovascular disease mortality. And let's use these data to communicate to policymakers. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Parker. As uh, you rightly said, most people link uh, exposure to poor air quality to poor respiratory health, but uh, the evidence is out now that it's one of the top, top, top of the table risk factors for ischemic heart disease as well. And I think that's important uh, insights that all of us need to become cognizant of. And um, 
uh, we'll come back again to you during the question answer session. But uh, I am uh, delighted now to welcome uh, on our panel, uh, Ms. Arti Kosla. Uh, so Arti, um, as I said, is a, is a very experienced communication uh, professional. And uh, today we are releasing um, a material, IEC material on air pollution and health effects that we're going to use in our CHAMP program, but it's also available uh, to others who would like to use them in other situations uh, in both English, Hindi and regional languages. And along with this, a, a toolkit for healthcare professionals um, around uh, air pollution and health effects. Uh, so uh, my colleague will be pasting the link to those documents in the chat. We will be using it like we mentioned before in our hospitals uh, CHAMP program. But Arti, over to you uh, to give us your views on the importance of uh, uh, communications and the role of healthcare professionals in particular um, around uh, communication for air quality and health. Arti. Very much, uh, Purnima, and uh, I'm quite honored to be in the stellar panel. I must admit that a lot of the discussion that happens in the uh, academic community, only a part of it gets carried forward. And I think uh, for, for, for clear limitations of being able to understand and assimilate so much of academic research and its relevance both for the public discourse as well as for policy making. I'll talk a little bit about my understanding of this issue, especially in the last five years and how we've tried to build the air quality campaign and what I've understood uh, the role that communications and health can play. I mean, first of all, certainly, uh, a lot of communication efforts have put air pollution in perspective and doctors coming out as educators and campaigners have taken the discussion out to the level of an average citizen. Uh, and I think uh, that really has been an important, uh, important way of just a heightened focus on the subject. It's one thing to have very technical studies like the global burden of disease and the very technical reports that keep coming out, but it is quite another when you're local physician tells you about air quality impacts and what you can do to safeguard yourself. So I think we've come at a point in the public discourse in the country in talking about environmental awareness and talking about public health issues, where this has become at least a subject which is of far greater attention, both by the doctors as well as the patients. And you know there is data in fact that is available to substantiate this. We did a very small survey about three years back and at that time already uh, 2000 people from all across the country in 17 locations and the awareness that people had about air quality was more than 90 percent so on the simple question on have you heard about air quality 90 percent more than 90 percent people said that they have on questions on whether you have heard about pm 2.5 pm 10 aqi I think the, uh, you can imagine how the responses will be. Some people had heard about 40% people who were reading newspapers had heard about AQI. Almost a similar percentage of people had heard about PM 2.5, but there was also almost 30% of people who had heard about none of that. And I think that's quite clear that there is also still a road to be traveled in terms of making air pollution a subject of greater understanding to the large swaths of people who are getting impacted by it, but who don't have any inclination of what's going on. It's the International Clean Air Day, and which is why we are all here. And earlier in the day, I was moderating a panel which had the Miss India runner-up from India, the, the, the young achiever uh, at the beauty pageant. And we had uh, another uh, influencer, so to speak, who was India's first female, uh, the world's first uh, physically challenged woman to scale Mount Everest. They're both women from the state of Uttar Pradesh and they were there on a certain panel to talk about air pollution from the state. And, and shockingly or not, uh, both of them were, were talking about things which none of, none of the discussions in this kind of an eco chamber are about. So the, the levels of understanding are quite distinct. The distance we traveled is quite huge. And I feel that the health community has played a role, but there is far more to be done in terms of just talking more to influencers, to people who are talking to citizens, to be able to create greater impact in policy making. Because unless that is not done, it just feels that we are, we are, there is a lot of research that is happening, but the impact on decision making is still lacking, possibly because there is 
no bottom up demand for clean air part of the reason why a lot of action doesn't happen in smaller cities uh, in rural areas because there is no demand for it possibly it will never be but i think if you're if you're really looking at what policy level change to make then also trying to figure out how the bottom up versus the top down can meet is one of the things to look at especially in terms of in terms of the role that the health sector can play in in communication just a couple of more points i was also analyzing social media a little bit because uh, for whatever it is worth maybe less than 1% of india is on twitter but a lot of the decision makers are there a lot of the influencer uh, influencers are there and uh, it turns out that over the last 3 or 4 years there is again a very significant increase in just the voices that are amplifying the health impacts of air pollution if you scan media which i do often just to see how reportage on air pollution is building i think one thing was quite clear that in the last 5 years the biggest stories so to speak that have happened in print publications uh, on air pollution are the ones which had health as the storyline so whether it is about uh, air pollution and diabetes or it is about two indians dying every minute due to air pollution or it's the indian express campaign called that by breath which they started in 2017 after which uh, times of india started their campaign called let me breathe all of these typically have just used health as the main message and everything else just sits beside it so i think that to me also as a communications person makes it very clear that if we are really looking at putting the message across then doctors are the most credible and the most respected and health is one message which really reduces the psychological distance so to say between what needs to happen and what should i do and i feel uh, especially in 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 campaigns and behavior change when we talk of how individuals can can bring action which can affect change we always talk about whether it is uh, whether it's conviction or it is coercion and it's very hard to make any kind of change when you are coercing somebody to 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 make a change but i think the the way the health statistics have come out the way a lot of the delhiites are now aware of the impact that air pollution has on their health it's a matter of conviction as opposed to just being coerced to take some action so i think also from a broader campaign on environmental awareness and on air quality it is quite uh, an important thing in my view to note that the more the doctors are able to add conviction to what needs to happen the more the, the faster is it that uh, we can also have individual awareness and individual action quite apart from a top down you know a centralized policy making approach which will always uh, remain wanting uh maybe i'll pause at this moment there can be more things always but uh, i i i i think uh, that's more or less what i'd like to say at this point thank you so much arti for that lucid overview and you know it's always interesting to listen to your perspectives you know not just uh, from the communications uh, professional kind of lens but overall because you uh, sit in many of these discussions with different audiences like you talked today about uh, uh a uh, beauty pageant uh, <laughs> you know winner who was who was in an air pollution panel uh, so it's really interesting to learn from you and uh, thank you so much i think uh, the what doctors being the credible voices is something that has been said over and over again now so i think um, uh, we are all the army that has to uh, take the war up against air pollution and health effects and and i think we are all pitched uh, together to do that uh, for sure uh, at least we saw the commitment here in this panel um i know we are running behind time but there are a couple of questions um in the pan uh, in the uh, question answer panel so please bear with me maybe i will direct a couple of them to the panelists here um oh, were they already answered maybe uh, they were uh, dr kiran uh, gulerya i think there was a question to you um so maybe you answered that did you because i don't see it there anymore yeah i have already answered it okay that's great thank you so much um uh, maybe i have a question actually for dr muli mohan i know you alluded to it in your uh, presentation i think the question has been there in everybody's mind about the link uh, between um, air pollution and covid-19 you mentioned a little bit about that uh, but in terms of the mechanistic pathways um 
could you tell us a little bit more about that? Because I think the one, um, th there are still two schools of thought over there, but then also about the chronic exposure to air pollution in a country like India, having already uh, compromised people's lung health, and maybe uh, that is one reason, but you talked about another mechanism as well. Could you tell us a little bit more? I think this is a question on everybody's mind. Yeah, so there are two aspects to it. Quite rightly, as you said, Indians start out with smaller lungs. This is partly genetic, uh, but also probably related to uh, the exposure of the mother uh, with the baby in utero to uh, pollutants, which seem to affect the uh, unborn fetus's lungs. And so we start out with smaller lungs, and therefore we are a little more susceptible to the effects of pollution after birth too, uh, and, and, and all other diseases that affect the lungs. So that's one aspect to it. The second aspect is, of course, the, uh, and, you know, to extend that further, if you start out with structural damage to the lungs, then you are more susceptible to COVID-19 or indeed any other infectious disease. The second aspect to it is what happens to the virus when you have a lot of suspended particulate matter in the air. And it seems to be especially that when you have, and I think uh, Dr. Parmesh may be able to tell us a little more about this, is when you have diesel fumes, especially, these particles hang around for a longer time. They cause greater inflammation in the lungs and virus particles can remain suspended for a longer time when they attach themselves to these uh, PM 2.5 particles and less. And when they are inhaled into the lungs, they uh, form a nidus of infection. They can attach themselves to the airway, have greater exposure to the uh, ACE2 receptors that we know are the portal of entry for the virus. And when you have an inflamed lung, you have an already high level of inflammation. And this is exaggerated when you have the virus. So these are all purely speculative at this stage and associative studies. But there seems to be very good evidence that COVID-19 uh, rates, severity rates and mortality rates are associated with greater pollution, areas of greater pollution. But this, this just reflects greater population density and therefore greater risk of transmission, or it act represents an actual, you know, cause effect relationship is still not very clear. Thank you so much. And uh, Dr. Parmesh, did you want to add anything on that? I think what you rightly said, these are all the hypothesis as a matter of fact, it is true. Air pollution, especially suspended particulate matter from diesel vehicle, nearly emissions 95% of the particle 2.5 micron from diesels. They have shown they have, if a deposit on the pollens, the allergy is more, 50 times more. Viruses may be carry attached to that one and carry, get attached to the uh, ACE receptor, these are high possibility. And also mortality has shown much higher, as you rightly pointed out, where there is a pollution is very high. In, not only in India, in, uh, in Peru, and in Italy has been shown, along with the USA. The studies have already been published. We have observed in Bangalore also, where pollution is very high, there the mortality seems to be high. But mechanism is one of the possibilities, yes. I think he covered very well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you both so much. Um, and I think, uh, my, uh, I'll direct my next question to uh, Dr. Kiran Guleria and Dr. Prabhakaran. Uh, simply because I think most people um, are uh, cognizant of the fact that respiratory health um, uh, is, is affected by exposure to air pollution and children are vulnerable. But um, are the uh, obstetrician, the fraternity and the cardiologist fraternity, because they seem to be more distant and not recognized very well yet by your uh, uh, groups. So is this starting to become an important area of discussion, you know, exposure to air pollution and its impacts on adverse birth outcomes or uh, Dr. Kubakran on cardiovascular outcomes. Dr. Oh. Kiran. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so what you're trying to ask is whether uh, as, as other obstetricians thinking that way, that this is an important uh, agent yes. for uh, various yes. clinical adverse outcomes. So I think uh, we have to really have to go a long way. Uh, I, there are, I mean, people are uh, in my community and as obstetricians, I think this is, environment is now being uh, seen as a, one of the etiological agent 
for various adverse clinical outcomes in pregnancy. There is mention of this also in the textbooks, but how much of it comes to your mind when you are actually sitting in your clinical practice, seeing the patients there? How much are we actually really, uh, you know, asking our patients or correlating the outcomes with various uh, seasonal changes of the uh, air pollution and how much, I don't think so, it is that much at the back of your mind uh, of all the obstetricians that uh, yes, can it, uh, should we look into this aspect also? Should we educate the patient? Should we ask certain questions related to this? Should we educate our patient according to? So this happens, you know, um, in a very, uh, suppose the, there, there is a lot of talk going on about the uh, environmental air pollution, for example, around Diwali, when, the, when everybody is talking about that air is bad, so it can affect so there are so, so those must be those may be the small uh, uh, seasonal talks which maybe uh, then you think that we should talk to the patients about this should or should the sometimes patients may come up with, uh, come up with some question or query to the obstetricians yes that will this air be bad for my um, you know, uh, uh, fetus or the or the child which is yet to be born I am living in an area which is very polluted, so can it affect me or affect my fetus, which is to, which is yet to be born? So that kind of awareness, I think, is going to take some uh, little longer, long time, both uh, in the obstetricians and in the um, patients. But of course, there are talks in between when the when everybody is talking about it. It's not there always. Like you know, these are certain issues which are not always addressed during your routine clinical practice. So we really need to have a lot of awareness about it, a lot of it. For example, let me tell you, we were having a, we were just having a class on fetal growth restriction yesterday, a postgraduate class. So the, 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 the question was asked, what are the various etiological factors? So, you know, environment came somewhere there that you, if you can't find, so maybe environment is also responsible and environmental factors are also responsible. So a little bit, um, you talk about it, but you do not give that much importance that it should be. So we really have to kind of more make everybody more aware of, of it. But let me tell you, during this project, when we talk to the patients, the patient and the, during this project, we made like our research officers, they made home visits also. So when you talk to the patient, uh, the, the pregnant woman's family around, they are really, really receptive. They want to make certain changes. They want, they, they want to, un yes, they do understand that this can cause, you know, then they also want to ask you ki, uh, what is the effect on the other members who are there because they were just concentrating on the female who was pregnant. So then there were a lot of questions and then people really got interested that what, what else can we do to make ourselves safe and what practices we can adopt in our household so that you, apart from her uh, exposure, everybody in the family is can get reduced exposure. So this is, I mean, if we educate, they are not very highly educated people. They, it's a low socioeconomic area. But if you try and talk to them, they do understand. And it creates interest and also they understand. So I think if we kind of, it has to be a campaign. It has to be uh, like uh, other things, uh, whatever, I mean, it has to come uh, as a campaign and it has to be on everybody's mind. So then it will probably make a difference. People are ready to accept. They're ready to listen and ready to change. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Kandularia. I think, uh, again, reiterating the role of communication and an important point about the receptiveness, the timing of that communication is also important. Like, so patients waiting in the waiting room of the hospital, if they are seeing this kind of information. So I, I, I guess that's heartening to note that the receptivity is also increasing, but there's a long way to go. So I think maybe having sessions on air pollution in your obstetrician conferences may be a, a good start. And, uh, and of course, we've been talking about including. So um, I think, the, so there I can tell you that our federation, which is a national federation, that is FOXI, they have a, special committee for this and they do we, we have a special program uh, to create this awareness about the environment uh, yeah. in our 
so we have also okay. have certain activities people have adopted certain areas to uh, you know in uh, chain, uh, the doctors have adopted certain areas where they plant more trees the climate needs to be changed so the, those kind of efforts are being put in by our national association also yeah so foxy is a member now of our network as well so we've yeah. started to do actually activities with them as well so so it's happening right. to so uh, quickly to dr prabhakaran what is the sense with the cardiologist fraternity right i think um, to advocate to cardiologists that they need to think about air pollution and climate change we have done three things recently at a global level uh, number one is uh, we wrote a small editorial piece which was published in four leading cardiology journals simultaneously the circulation european journal of uh, cardiology journal of american uh, college of cardiology and the global heart the second thing that i just shared the uh, world heart federation's advocacy piece on the chat box uh, which is a uh, which has several um, resources for cardiologists to look at in a very simplified way in terms of what can be done and uh, what needs to be done thirdly um, we have the cardiology society of india and the association of physicians of india joining together with around 20 other associations across the world and writing to uh, un and uh, who i mean to who director general and to other un officials in terms of advocating for air pollution we are also liaising with the local uh, community uh particularly cardiology society of india in terms of educating them with regard to air pollution in addition there are research efforts actually to show that robust relationship because many people say that uh, most of the data are model and uh, you know how uh, credible are these model data so so we need we are we are working on those exposure assessment side too in terms of creating the credible pm 2.5 levels but i think more work needs to be done and we need to clearly show some of these um disaggregated relationships particularly in terms of sulfur dioxide nitrogen dioxide uh, the heavy metals and others and we are working in those areas uh, the other thing which i wanted to say is we just have published a paper uh, with cardiology society of india of the differences in the number of heart attacks in 2019 and 2020 and there have been uh the number of people who had heart attacks were higher the mortality was higher in uh, 2020 and we are planning to do an analysis based on uh, pm 2.5 levels based on their locations to see if there's a difference so cardiologists are becoming aware okay so on that heartening note uh, that there is an increasing trend on the awareness um, uh, amongst all the groups of uh, professionals health professionals uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us here today arti i'm going to give you the final word on what what you thought about this, like you know um, all um, specialties becoming increasingly aware and what do you think the way forward looks like thanks i'm not the one who deserves the final word here but i will only say that there is lots of scientific evidence that is available and i think it's a constant uh, fight that we are all in to some extent to just make this understandable to the wider public but also make it understandable to the political class i'll just cite one example you know of the 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 big debate in the country on putting pollution cutting equipment on thermal power plants and studies that have been conducted which show that if pollution cutting equipment is installed it will increase the power cost per unit of power to a consumer by 30 paisa or 40 paisa and what it is juxtaposed next to is how many lives will be lost and the decision that is made in policy making would be on how many million lives lost versus how much more consumers will have to pay for power and as you can imagine the pollution cutting uh, technology compliance has been pushed back to 2035 because it's quite expensive at the moment and uh, it's it's hard to bear that burden especially when the economy is bleeding i think the the fundamental message is we are still at a point where we have a lot of lot of uh, scientific evidence and medical evidence but the needle on policy making with respect to taking decisions in consonance with health has to get stronger i'll pause 
Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, once again, I want to extend my heartfelt gratitude on behalf of my team at the Center for Chronic Disease Control. Um, and also, I represent the Center for Environmental Health at the Public Health Foundation of India. To all of you, uh, Dr. Kiran Buderia, Dr. Paramesh, Dr. Murli Mohan, Dr. Prabhakran, and of course, Aarti, for joining us today on this panel and providing all those uh, important insights to our uh, participants here today. And I uh, uh, end with an earnest plea to all of you to spread the message on communication and the role of healthcare professionals. Um, and hopefully we will um, expand and enhance this advocacy around air pollution and health impacts through our CHAMP program as well. So uh, to you and to all the people in the audience, do reach out to us if you want to be a part of this program as well. Thank you once again and have a good evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mazur, for your hosting of the call. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, everyone.